Good morning, everyone. Please, I invite you to take a moment now, turn around, greet one another with the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ today. Several announcements to bring to your uh, attention this morning. First, a reminder that we have a very brief congregational meeting right after worship. We have one more person to elect to the session for the class of 2017. So Conk will be making their report. It shouldn't be more than a five-minute session meeting or a congregational meeting. Um, I've also been asked to remind you that next Saturday morning is Hanging of the Greens. Um, it's going to be done on a Saturday this year, so if you're free and interested, come on by the church around 9 o'clock and we will be um, decorating the place for the holidays. Related to that, uh, in the back on the worship bulletin board, which is to the left of the doors as you leave, you will find the poinsettia sign-up sheet for the holidays. If you're interested in donating a flower in memory or in honor of someone, you can sign up there and um, just get a check to the church office sometime over the next couple of weeks. Hopefully you've all taken home a Stay Treat brochure coming up at the end of January. They are at both exits today. They are in the fellowship hall over by the, uh, where you'll have coffee this morning. Please don't forget to take one of those home. Find out more about it and make sure you have the dates on your calendar. A box is in the narthex. We are going to be collecting toys for UCM. Um, there is an information sheet on that box. Take one home. You can find out a little bit more about that. We will be collecting those toys over the next couple of weeks. Any other announcement about that? Is Bill? Bill is away. Anything else that needs to be lifted up about that? Herb, anything more that you know about that? So help out. All right, great. Um, the last thing is just a word of thanks to Judy Key and um, Kay Wood for the, the beautiful cornucopia on the communion table today. Um, we did this last year and we're going to do it again today. When you leave, we would encourage you just to take something from the table, whether it's just a radish or an orange or something, for two reasons. We would encourage you to somehow use it in your Thanksgiving uh, meal preparation as a reminder to be praying for Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church and to just be grateful for this incredible church family that we've been given. So after worship, not now, um, after worship, feel free to come on down, take a nut or like I said, a pepper, something, and use it in your Thanksgiving meal. Yes, Anita. Okay, and Chuck, you have something? Thanksgiving. Go ahead, tell us what's happening. Okay, if you're home alone and want to spend, uh, th have your Thanksgiving meal here, see Chuck. Chuck has details about what will be happening. To show. <laughs> what time should they show up? Four o'clock in Fellowship Hall, and what should people bring? Bring themselves. Okay, four o'clock, Fellowship Hall. Um, join, join the Higdon family for, for Thanksgiving dinner. Any, any other announcements that need to be lifted up today? 
I'm sorry? There, you're seeing announcements for all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the Advent dinner, the Advent event, all kinds of things coming up. So please watch the screens, read your bulletin, read the stabilizer and the Friday update. Um, you can sign up for the Advent dinner over in Fellowship Hall. Yeah. All right, let's, um, during this week of Thanksgiving, let us truly try to quiet all of the distractions of our lives and come together so that we can give God thanks and worship Him in spirit. And in truth this morning, come, friends, let us worship God. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today in this time of conscious thanksgiving where we sit back, look over the last year, and view the blessings that you have given and bestowed upon us. Please help us remember those whose year has not been so good and who feel a lack, perhaps, of your presence. Let us pray for them, and we pray that they may feel your joy and feelings of fulfillment in that. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Um, today's reading is from Psalm 34. You'll find it on your, in your Bibles, Pew Bibles, on page 441. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. 
I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. This is the word of the Lord. At this time, would the boys and girls come on down front and join me for the children's sermon, please? So, you got something good in that bag this morning for us, buddy? Yeah? You want to show us what's inside? What did you bring today? Let's see. What is that? A dinosaur. A dinosaur. A dinosaur. What? Is this a pterodactyl? Is it a pterodactyl? And where did you get it? Somebody gave it to you? Yeah? Do you like dinosaurs? So, so when did, did dinosaurs live? Do you know? When did dinosaurs live? Uh, long time ago. A long time ago. That, that's my years. answer. A, a long time ago. What were you going to say? Back in the old days. That's what I was going to kind of say, Jocelyn. When, when dinosaurs were living on the earth, what else was on the earth? Were people on the earth? No. Birds. No, birds maybe, okay. Dinosaurs Kate. are birds. Dinosaurs are birds? Are they? Some are. Yeah. Some probably are. Watch, you don't Actually, knock that over. dinosaurs are still living now. There are dinosaurs still living now? Well, only one type. What type? The type that, um, that sort of looks like a sea serpent snake. Really? I didn't know that there were dinosaurs still living today. Yeah. Huh. Uh, my, I'm interested in who was living when dinosaurs were living. Squirrels. Squirrels? I'm not sure. What do you think, Ian? No, I think cavemen. Cavemen and women were maybe living? Do you think 
Do you think when dinosaurs lived on the earth, were there houses on the earth? No. Dinosaur houses. Shh. Don't scream. Were there were there cars when dinosaurs lived? Dinosaur cars. No. Were there um, were there churches? No. Dinosaur churches. Oh, but we're in church. Here's here's a question. Do you think way back when dinosaurs lived, do you think God was around? Yeah. Before the world was created, God was around? Yeah, before the universe was created. Yeah, if, if, if and even God knew how the dinosaurs, and if there wasn't God, then there would be no dinosaurs even on the earth. If there, there was no... Shh, wait a minute. Wait, let's listen. If there were... Ian just said if there were no God, if there was no God, dinosaurs wouldn't even be on the earth. A lot of times, people think that when you talk about dinosaurs and, and things that happened millions of years ago, that that somehow means that God isn't responsible for creation. But you know what? God has always been and God always will be. Okay? And where, where dinosaurs came from and where people came from, we really don't know. But what we do know is that somehow... God is responsible for everything, even dinosaurs. Okay, what were you? What do you want to dinosaurs say? Dinosaurs are part squirrel, birds, wolves, and they are part um, sea serpent, snakes. Okay, well, thank you for that little science lesson this morning. We appreciate it. How about um, we thank Kent for bringing this in? Good job, buddy. Thanks for bringing that to us today. And also, they're part cat. And and we're gonna give this bag. Here, take it out of there. Yeah, you want to take that out of there. Who, who has not had this yet? I want it, I want it, I want it. Who, have you guys all had it? I want it, I want it. I don't, I don't. Okay. Have you not had it before? No, I haven't, oh. but I want it again. It, okay, everybody had it one My time. Have you haven't had it at all? We have one, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. You haven't had it at all, okay. Are you going to be here next I Sunday? Uh, okay, fill it up, yeah. bring it back. Okay, let's, you guys, hey, 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 hey. This is not a time for us to play, right? This is a time for us to learn a little bit more about God, right? So let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads and let's talk to God right now, okay? Dear God, thank you for always being here, for always loving us. Help us to love you back. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said... Amen. Okay, thank you guys. You can go back to your seat.
Will you pray with me, please? God, your spirit is present always. Open our hearts and our minds, even our ears now, so that we might hear what that spirit is saying to us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. I invite you to continue to Listen this morning to the words from the psalmist in Psalm 34. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you, His holy ones. For those who fear Him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and covets many days to enjoy good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Friends, the word of the Lord and the poetry of the faithful, thanks be to God. Okay, so let me just get it right out on the table now. Among the many things the church has messed up over the years is its understanding of blessings. And on this week of Thanksgiving, where we're all so prone to want to talk about and give thanks for blessings, I thought this morning we might spend a little time looking at that word. My Aunt Jenny used to say, God bless you every time someone sneezed. My friend from rural North Carolina blessed my little heart every time I talked about something that I was struggling with. My patriotic father is convinced that America is a nation that has been divinely blessed. And my well-off college friend continues to believe that his success in life is the result of nothing less than blessings from above. For that matter, who among us during this week of Thanksgiving will not at some point look at our lives and not feel as though God has showered us with blessings. Even if we're going through a hard time. Even if we're dealing with things that have brought deal, a great deal of pain and anguish to our lives. Just about all of us, I think, consider the good things that we enjoy each and every day and we attribute them to some kind of divine blessing from God. A reward for something we think we've done that has made us worthy of this divine gift-giving. We believe the right way. We're a citizen of a Christian nation. We behave ourselves, and we're, we're generally just pretty good people. At, at least we're not really bad. So as a result, God looks down on us and smiles, right? Right? He opens the floodgates of heavenly bounty on us and our families and our nation. It's so appropriate, I think, for the last Sunday of the church year, the day known as Christ the King Sunday to fall four days before Thanksgiving because sometimes our view of Christ well, our view tends to be one of some kind of king in the clouds who doles out blessings upon each one of us, his loving and faithful servants. Like Santa Claus, he checks his list, separates the naughty from the nice, and gifts his good children with life's blessings. 
Well, forgive me if I sound as though I'm mocking this idea. But I do know it's understandable for us to believe this way. Any cursory reading of the Bible gives testimony often to these kinds of thoughts. Time and again, going through the Bible, we read stories about people who believed in God and so God blessed them and good things happened to them. We read about people who strayed and how God supposedly cursed them. In Genesis, God blesses Adam and Eve And thus, they were fruitful and able to multiply. Then, a little later on, he curses them. And so, Eve delivers Cain and Abel and Seth in pain. Because we all know that the pain of childbirth is God's curse. If Adam and Eve hadn't just given in to that temptation for the slice of apple pie, women, childbirth would not be at all painful. We look, at, we look at Abraham and Sarah. They were blessed even in old age, right? We know that. And they were given children who would become a great nation. But then, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, God curses the people of that great nation whenever they dishonored their father, distorted justice, or hit a neighbor. That's what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? The New Testament is really no different. God blesses some there and curses others. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us the poor and the peacemaker and those who are persecuted for their faith, they will be blessed. But then, then in Revelation, we read that those who are lukewarm in their faith, they will be spewed out of the mouth of God. It's no wonder the church has been confused. And we shouldn't be surprised by it. 2,000 years ago, when these biblical stories were first being told, when they were being written down, this was the way people thought. When the Jewish people were able to escape from Egypt and cross the Red Sea because the water was so low, surely it was because God was blessing them. Several hundred years later, when those same people, now divided nations, were overtaken, first by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians, of course it was because God was punishing them. National, political, cultural, and religious events were always explained away either by God's blessing or by God's curse. That's how people understood the events of their lives. And things were no different personally. A family's good harvest really had nothing to do with the weather or the rain. It was all about God's favor. Illness? Illness was nothing short of God's wrath. Now, fortunately, over time, these kinds of religious superstitions vanished. Indians realized that their rain dances really did not have an effect on whether or not they had a wet or a dry summer. And while there are still some Roman Catholics today who may bury a statue of St. Anthony upside down in their yard, you know, when they go to sell a house, Most people, most people realize it's really more fun than grounded in any kind of deeply held religious belief. People have grown. And for most of us, our understanding of faith has grown. But what has that growth done to our understanding of blessing? What have 2,000 years taught us about the real blessings Of God. The word blessing in in Scripture is both a noun, meaning divine favor, and a verb, a verb that implies the infusion of holiness or spiritual redemption. Let's, Let's start with a noun this morning. 
Blessing as a noun. Finding favor with God. Pretty basic. Relatively simple. But the question that follows is who exactly finds favor with God? Is it all of us? Is it some of us? Unfortunately, as I've already indicated, too often we think that God blesses only certain people. People who who think and act and sadly believe the way we do. That's what we're inclined to want to believe. In the Old Testament, the Jews believed that they were the apple of God's eye. Then in the New Testament, we see followers of Jesus believing that they were the real chosen ones. They did open it up to the Gentiles eventually, but even that was looked upon with suspicion. Today, even in the Christian community, the blessed ones, the real chosen ones, they're only the ones who believe the right things, the right way. We're no different than most religions, actually. Muslim extremists today are debating these very same issues, raining terror upon the world in an attempt to convert us all because God certainly does not bless or in any way affirm those who do not think the way they think or believe the way they believe. But this is the first aspect of blessing that we need to carefully reconsider this morning. Because if God created us all, if God created all humanity and said, you are very good, then what makes us think that God only blesses some? What makes us think that ours are the only hearts in which the Spirit dwells? What makes us think that ours are the only temples or the only sanctuaries in which God can be found? Most of us grew up singing, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. What happens when we grow up and become adults? Today, for too many, it's Jesus loves only people who are like me. What happens to that simple understanding of God's blessing? Just as, just as the rain falls on the just and the unjust, God's blessings fall on everyone. We are all blessed. All the peoples of the earth. And any teaching about blessing that lacks that kind of inclusivity fails in its faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is my first point this morning. We are all, every one of us, divinely favored because we are all God's very good creation. Every human being on the face of this earth, is blessed simply because every human being on the face of this earth is loved and cared for by God. Point one. But what about blessing as a verb? How exactly does God bless us? That's the next question that has been ruminating in my mind over the past couple of weeks. And in order for us to consider that question, we need to understand that verb to bless. It's not just something that God does for us. But in the passage that was read this morning, particularly the part that Kimberly read for us, we see that blessing is something that we do to God. We bless God. That is how The portion of Psalm 34 that she read goes, I will bless the Lord at all times. What does it mean for us to bless God? Because I think our understanding, the answer to that question, will better help us understand how God blesses us. And more importantly, how God does not bless us. So think about the way you Bless God. What does it mean for us to bless God? I'm going to ask you that question. How do you do that? 
How do you bless God? By being good to others. By teaching others. By praying, by communing with God, talking to God. Okay? By giving God praise and glory. By following His commandments. By loving Him. By doing unto others. Great. Any more? How do you bless God? By thanking Him for walking with you at all times. It's so interesting. Think about it. Do any of the answers, all of which are beautiful answers, do any of those answers involve anything material that you give to God? Yes or no? No, not material at all. In fact, nothing that anyone said had anything to do with giving things material to God. In fact, when you look at the history of the church, We've kind of moved beyond this idea that, that we need to like sacrifice our children to God or that we somehow need to kill the fatted calf in order to, to prove. We've moved beyond that. The giving of blessing to God has nothing to do with anything material. So my question is, why do we so often think that that is the way God blesses us? Why do we so often think that the material things in our lives are the things that God has given to us as blessings? Is it possible that your good job is not a gift from God, but maybe just the result of your good work? Hard work. Faithful work. Is it possible that, that the gift of relationships and friendships is really not anything about God doing something for you, but rather is the way you have just gone about living your life, caring for others, serving others, loving others? Life is full of blessings. Some of them are from God, and some of them... Well, frankly, some of it's just dumb luck. Some of it's just hard work. Some of it's just the fruit of your living in a land that gives you so many freedoms and opportunities. They're not from God at all. So today, this week, when we prepare to gather with family and friends around a table that's overflowing with food, more food than most of us really need, we need to remember what it is we are really being thankful for. I love turkey as much as the next guy. I could eat stuffing and green bean casseroles and even my aunt's pistachio jello mold every day of the week. Apple pie could be a sixth food group for me. But but is that abundance really what God's blessings amount to in our lives? December 4th, 1619, on the Berkeley Plantation in Southern Virginia, that supposed day of the very first Thanksgiving, it had nothing to do with the bounty of food. In fact, a faithful study of history has to call into question whether or not God was actually responsible for much of what happened when the English arrived on our shores. Think about it. When the first Thanksgiving was held, our Virginia ancestors believed that God really did keep them alive and had sustained them, perhaps even brought them here to this very country so that they might be a city set on a hill. Well, I hate to burst any pilgrim bubbles this morning, but after stealing land, 
after imposing one way of thinking and living and even believing, I wonder whether God had really much to do with what happened 400 years ago at all. Sitting down with the Indians, bowing their heads, and thanking God for all the blessings that were being enjoyed and experienced. Friends, that view of thanksgiving, that understanding of this holiday that we're getting ready to celebrate, not only misunderstands the way God blesses us, but it makes a mockery of gratitude at just about every level. We could debate this morning the course of American history that was set back in 1607 forever. And I say debate because our story has chapters that are kind of positive and chapters that are also kind of negative. But in the end, it was a business venture that led to the founding of this nation. A nation that today is arguably one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth. But God didn't bring us into being any more than God brought any other nation into being. The unhappy, angry Brits brought us into being. That's why we are here today. And we need to be careful not to confuse what they did with what God did. We need to be careful not to follow and allow superstitions of ancient peoples thinking about what really is responsible for this land today. For all that allowed us to flourish, we need to be careful to know what was from God and what was not. My point, my point is that thanksgiving simply cannot be about blessings that have nothing at all to do with our faith. It's not just a national holiday. It's a religious holiday. And as 21st century Americans seeking to follow Jesus, our gratitude this week should be born in thanksgiving, not for Turkey, with all the trimmings. It should not be born in our pleasure with all of the possessions that we have. As wonderful as they might be, our gratitude, our gratitude comes from the realization that God has created the world good and everything in it. And that in Jesus Christ, we have discovered the best ways to live together in peace and in harmony, loving all people. The gratitude that we need to foster and celebrate this week, it's not about things. It's not about our happiness it's not about our health. It's not about being privileged to be part of some kind of great political empire or to live in some mighty world power. The gratitude that needs to be growing in our hearts this week is about having discovered the only king worthy of our ultimate allegiance. And that is Jesus. It's about an allegiance to the life to which we have been called. So this week, let's be thankful for the roofs over our heads, for the health of our families and friends. By all means, let's go ahead and be grateful for good jobs, for special relationships, for times of rest, and play. Come, ye thankful people, come. Be grateful. But let's never confuse the fruit of our labors with the blessings from God. If we're going to thank we all our God, let's just be clear on what we're thanking God for. A bountiful table? No. The beauty of creation? Yes. Gravy and mashed potatoes, not really. 
abundant grace and mercy? Of course. The privilege of living in America? Not so much. The privilege of being part of the human family? Most definitely. Health. Wealth. Again, not so much. Peace. Perseverance. By all means. Each one of us here today, each one of us has been richly blessed in all kinds of ways and for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes our blessings are the result of hard work. Other times because of the kindness of others. And still other times just because we're lucky. This week, this week our gratitude is to be directed toward God. To the blessings that come from God. The blessings of faith and hope and love. The blessings of goodness and beauty, and harmony. The blessings of peace, and joy, and vision. The blessings of unity, self-knowledge, authenticity. This is why we celebrate Thanksgiving. This is why we cry out, thank we all, our God. This is why we crown Him with many crowns. God's blessings have been given to every one of us. So let's, by all means, be thankful. And then let's take those blessings from above and use them to bless others and to change this world. All for the glory and the honor the praise of our God, today and always. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? God, as we seek to grow our gratitude, always, but, but especially this week, help us to think deeply. Help us to look carefully at our lives and how they are so enriched by our faith, by our walk with you. as we consider those blessings. God, make us truly thankful and grow in us the desire to share those blessings with all. For the sake of Jesus, in whose name we pray, This time, would the ushers please come forward to receive our offerings.
so what are you thankful for as we prepare to leave? Keeping in mind some of those words this morning, what are you grateful for this day, this week? Kimberly? On Tuesday, Russ and I are celebrating 25 years of bliss. <laughs> we'll, give, very for that. We're, we'll give thanks for 25 years of bliss, marriage bliss. Abel? Thanks to Faye and Chuck, we delivered 75 shoeboxes this week. Wonderful. We'll give thanks for that. What else are you grateful for? Kay? For the love that comes to us from family and friends. For, for long-time friendships and for wonderful siblings. Deb? For finding a church family. Eleanor? Well, for an inspiring pastor. Thanks, Eleanor. <laughs> Judy, thank you. What are you thankful for? We're going to give thanks for Louise. She fell this week and she wasn't hurt too badly. And we're giving thanks for your celebrating the holiday with your son this week. Faye? Thankful for honey cakes. We sure don't have a million. So please raise me for a name for honey cake. And really, when I think about Bob's message, the one thing that we all need to do at church is to forgive each other. We're going to give thanks for um, honey cakes again, <laughs> and we will give thanks for this gift of forgiveness, a real blessing from God that, that brings healing and wholeness and health all the time. Thanks, Faye. Anything else? Anita? For health? health. For health. We will give thanks for good health. Okay, we're going to give thanks for college kids at home, our home, especially Russell, and we'll pray for you as you go on a, you're going on a mission trip when? Thursday? Wednesday. Where are you headed? Okay, to Mosaic, where um, you will celebrate Thanksgiving with a lot of international students who can't go home. We will we'll give thanks for that ministry and for that, that gift. Yes, Jean. We're giving thanks for everyone who participates and chips in for Agape, um, especially for just for a great Thanksgiving celebration last Friday. Jug. Jug's son's son's wife gave birth to a beautiful daughter, so you are a great, great grandfather again. We will give thanks with you today. Anita? For the love of little children. For the love of little children. Sorry, Carla. Okay, gratitude, I, I'm sorry? Okay, gratitude just for uh, everyone at Hybla Valley who is making educating minorities an issue, an important one, and working hard to, to make sure that happens. We'll, we'll celebrate that with you, Carla. Yes, Anita. 
for the joy of music and for our organist and director. Great. For all of the people who have impacted Louise's life for 98 years, whose names she forgets, but whose impact you will remember, we will give thanks with you today. That's great. Melinda? Thanks to our president for giving hope to 5 million people. For Junie? To all of our youth and to the parents who raise them and support them. We are so blessed. Let's, um, you know what, Betsy? How about we sing the doxology? Can we do that a cappella if you don't have the music handy? Give us a note. Let's just sing the doxology. Stand and let's uh, give God praise with these great words. What's the note again? Praise God from whom all blessings. that you would receive all of the praise and glory, all the gratitude and thanksgiving that we bring before you this day and throughout this week. Keep our eyes focused on the blessings of life that have come truly from you and make us a thankful people. God, our desire always is to live lives that truly bless you. Lives that bring you honor and glory. We do that today and every day by, as the words of our closing hymn will challenge us, by crowning you with many crowns. Whatever that means, whatever that looks like, may we so live today and always. We give you thanks for the gift of Jesus. Hear us now as we pray together with the words he taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Now, friends, as you go forth from this place, know God goes with you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, within you to strengthen you, and always before you to show you his way. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.